I'm going to talk today about black leg disease of potato. Um, I'm involved in a project as part of the bacterial plant diseases program called DESBL, and I'll say a little bit about some of the work that we're doing right at the end, but I'm going to really focus on potato and the disease itself. So I'll start looking at potato. Potato is the fourth most important stable food crop globally and it feeds over a billion people a day. Globally, it's worth over 70 billion pounds and it's worth over 3 billion to the UK alone. Interestingly, Europe has the highest potato consumption of 90 kilos a year or 1.7 kilograms a week. So if you're not eating potatoes, some poor soul somewhere else in Europe is having to eat twice as much. So. I think the lesson is to, to help out and start eating potato. This map shows us several things. First of all, it shows us that potato can be grown around the whole, uh, many parts of the world. And this is important because it can grow in different climatic zones, which is essential for food security. And a lot of other major crops can't do that. What might surprise people is that China and India are the two biggest producers of potato. They produce, produce about half of all potatoes worldwide. And then Europe, all the countries in Europe together produce another quarter. And interestingly, Ukraine is the third biggest potato producer in the world, followed by Russia and the US. So black leg disease is caused by two or three different types of bacteria. The one that we're focusing on is called Pectobacterium. It's an organism very similar to E. coli, but can cause disease in plants rather than humans. It's present, uh, it causes a disease called black leg or soft rot. And these diseases are present in most potato producing nations, if not all potato producing nations, and they reduce tuber quality and yield and have a major economic impact. Uh, the plants that you see here with a red background, one's health, the one on the right is healthy, the one on the left is diseased. What happens is that the bacteria contaminate the potato seed tubers that you plant in order to grow the plants and under certain weather conditions, usually when you get a lot of water around, the bacteria multiply, move up into the plant cause a general wilting and cause this black rot at the base of the stem. And this, where, this is where the black leg name comes from. It can also cause tuber rots in the soil, in the, in the field or in storage. Up to 70% of potato growing areas can be affected by black leg disease. And this can lead to losses of around 50 million pounds per year in the UK alone. This is in addition to numerous other pests and disease, disease losses, which happen for potato and other crops. In fact, it's been calculated that in Europe, between 15 and 25% of all crops are lost due to pests and diseases, which I think is a staggering number, uh, even with the use of pesticides. And what's even more staggering is that globally, pests and diseases are responsible for something like 40% of all crop losses. We don't have any pesticides to control black leg disease. So it's done in a number of other ways. And this is just an example. First of all, when you start the production system through a number of seed generations, you start with plants that are grown in the laboratory in agar. And this is partly to make sure that they're completely free of pests and diseases. These are then used, uh, are grown in compost and you get these mini tubers up here, which again are free from pests and diseases, and they go on to form the first generation of potato seed in your field. You then plant for about another five generations of seed. So you harvest one and replant it the next year, harvest that, replant it the next year for about five generations. And government inspectors come in twice a year or sometimes three times a year to look to see if they can find disease. And if they do find disease, in order to keep a check on it and make sure it doesn't get out of hand in the main production system, uh, this can, they, 
they can let government know and this can affect the quality of the seed and therefore the money the farmer gets back for that seed. When the plants are growing in the field, we're looking at ways that we can try to control black leg disease. One way is the use of viruses called bacteriophages, and you see them here. This is an actual uh, electron microscope image of them attaching to a bacteria. These are viruses that only attack bacteria, and the ones that we use only attack pectobacteria, and they're completely specific don't affect the environment or, or humans in any way. And we're getting some success with using that as a control option. We're also using very specific proteins that attack these pectobacteria called bactericins, and we're having success with those as well. When the bacteria come out of the field and go into storage, it's really important that all the machinery is thoroughly disinfected, as you can see this person doing here. And then the tubers can go into storage where they're stored in boxes, wooden boxes with lots of air vents in. And then um, cold air is blown through the boxes, through the storage season, through the winter. And this is really important because it keeps the tubers dry and cool and therefore reduces the impact of any disease. There are many aspects of work that we're doing on the DESBL project as part of this program. And the idea is to try to find new ways to control the disease. And one way we think is that if we can show that infection occurs in ways other than infected, uh, sorry, contaminated seed tubers, we might be able to focus our efforts elsewhere and find new control methods. I'm just gonna give you one example. What we're doing is working with the University of Dundee to do uh, microscopy to see if we can identify whether the bacteria is able to infect via the root system. And this will give us some new options for control. So what you see here is a, a light microscope. You can see the root going from the top to the bottom. You can see the root hairs growing out of that. And in the background, I hope you can see lots of little black dots. And those black dots are bacteria. And if I start this video, I'm hoping that you can see those bacteria moving. And what you're going to see any second is on the, the middle on the left hand side is a laser fire at the root and cause some physical damage. There you go. And that physical damage has released nutrients into the uh, surrounding um, media. And what you'll see in the next 10 or 20 seconds is just how quickly the bacteria are able to swim towards the site where the nutrients are being released and to start to colonize that site. So if you focus on the right hand side, you can see the bacteria are not really changing. That's just that general cloud. But on the left now, you will see two or three zones where the bacteria are really concentrating on the nutrients coming out of the root. And it, this is the beginning of colonization. The second type of microscopy is called light sheet microscopy. And in this case, we can view things differently. We can view things via fluorescence, so we can look, we can color things differently. And we can also do time lapse. And what you're seeing here is a root, the time lapse of a root growing. We've labeled the, the root is in green, it's autofluorescence in green, and we've labeled our pectobacteria with a red protein. What you see when we add the bacteria is that they colonize the tip of the root mainly, and this is because the tip produces most of the nutrients and they're feeding off those nutrients. But then all the way up the root, bacteria have stayed behind and are colonizing that root. So we know that they colonize, we know that they move to the site of infection. And this last image is confocal microscopy, so a third kind of microscopy. The arrow at the bottom indicates where the laser caused damage to the root. And then we look two days later and we can see that the bacteria are well and truly inside of that root. What we need to do now is check whether this is a prerequisite to go on and cause infection or whether it's just part of a um, colonization effect. So we have a lot more work to do on that, but, but for us, really interesting initial results.
it's really important with the work that we do that it doesn't stop at the science and that it gets out to industry. And we've got some fantastic industry people on the team whose job it is, is to identify the parts of the science that they think are important to industry and get that out. And uh, Graham, Mark and Simon here in the picture are all part of the project and have all done a fantastic job of getting that science out to industry. And we also produce fact sheets that help to get that information out as well. OK, so I'm going to stop there. I just want to thank lots of people involved in the project. Most of the work we haven't been able to talk about today, but hopefully another day. And of course, thanks to the funders for funding the work.